just got back out of prison. I'm curious if you had any communication with him, kind of just get an idea of what kind of mood he's in, what kind of shape he's in. Um, I talked to him. I, I talked to John right, literally right when he got out of prison, because Ken Pavia, who's kind of been looking after him while he's been in prison and trying to help him make sure everything was right when he got out, um, called me with him literally right when he got released. Um, you know, I mean, he, he lost a lot of weight. He was in solitary for a long time when he was in prison just to kind of, by, by his own kind of desire to stay out of trouble and stay out of a general population type of setting. Um, he was treated the day after he got released um, and I guess thrown up all over the gym because he hadn't had much training. You know, you don't do a lot of grappling, a lot of striking in prison. So, um, you know, he's back and he's got, he's got literally... Uh, 11 weeks to get ready, or 12 weeks to get ready before his fight. Is there any concern that uh, this might be just kind of pushing him a little too quickly after the release? Or He won. I mean, we asked him that. You know, he and I were, were going back and forth on letters and stuff like that, and we asked him, we said, why don't you just wait? Why don't you just take a fight and then and kind of get your feet back under you and then go into, like, the second tournament on Spike? And he's like, I just need the motivation. And, and if you track his story, um, when he got, when the first time when he was out, for about a nine-month run before he got put back in jail, he did nothing wrong. I mean, you know, John's John. He's going to say dumb things on a consistent basis, but he didn't break any laws. Yeah. He didn't punch anybody on the street. He was just, he was as as uh, as good as John has ever been over an extended period. So, but the, the judge put him back in jail for something he had done prior to his last incarceration. So, um, he just said, "Look, I need the direction. I, I don't, I don't want to be floating. I don't want to not know when a fight's going to be. I want total direction." So that's what we gave him. It's a short time period to get ready. As deep as our welterweight division is, it's a short time period to get ready. I mean, you're talking about, you know, Semtex Daly, and you're talking about Doug Lehman, you're talking about Ben Killaby Saunders, and that's just the first three. So um, there's some other rock stars in that division. But, you know, John's, uh, that's what he asked for. So, you know, that's what he's going to get. What do you think about the, uh, I don't know if you've seen like, the fans on Twitter, they're, they're kind of critical about that edge with the war machine tonight. Um, they're just saying, like, is this the right guy to, you know, promote on Spike TV with the new, with the new season? The like, live in jail. Concern, yeah. I, uh, I think we might, we perhaps should have done a better job explaining the, the series that's going to happen on the web is kind of a 24-7 behind the scenes. So, uh, I, like, Saunders' story is all about being down at AT&T and his, the love of his dog and the kind of his family relationship and what he's trying to come back and have another tournament success. Lima's story is different. Daly's is what he does in the U.K., and John's story is, I've been in prison, and so that's substantively part of the story. It's kind of like you're 24-7 behind the scenes. So I think people viewed it, people might have viewed it as, a, as an advertising hook. It was much more of, look, you're going to get to see, you're not just going to see guys training. You're going to get to kind of see where they are and who they are and what's going on. And John's story is deeply rooted in the problems he's had. So you're going to see a lot of that. And some of that is him being in prison and talking to our cameras through prison glass. So... Um, you know, I, I don't, you know, John's a, you know, if John hadn't had that Roger Huerta win and looked as good as he did, John had things back on track. And when John is not doing the wrong thing, he's a very talented, very aggressive fighter who brings the fight and makes for great TV. Um, so, you know, we, we, had, we had him signed originally when I did the deal with ESPN Deportes three and a half years ago. And then he said some incredibly stupid things, and we cut him. And then he went and kind of, and he had a run in different places, and then got in trouble again and got out, and just over about a six-month period begged us for a shot. And, uh, and I said, if you stay clean and you don't make any mistakes, and then it's kind of hard when somebody stays clean for nine months and doesn't make mistakes, but then gets thrown back in because of something that happened previously to go, you know, no, you got to kind of stand by your what you've said. So we did. So, you know, I... He's an, he's an interesting character, you know, he's an interesting character. My bigger concern is, is 11 weeks enough time for anybody to get ready, um, having been away for nine months for this level of competition. We'll see, you know. I don't is know. there any fear of yeah. maybe the sport or Bellator in a bad light by running a commercial like that? No, I mean, it, again, it won't be, there's nothing, he won't be in commercials in that vein in any way, shape, or form. This is really a behind-the-scenes look that will be on the website, and you'll get, you know, a 30-minute piece on John. Some of it will deal with his time in prison. Some of it will deal with where he is now, where he's training, what he's doing, what he's eating, how he's staying out of trouble. Obviously, Lima's story and Ben Saunders and Daly is going to be a totally different tack. But, um, you know, I, I hope people didn't, didn't interpret it to be an ad for what, come watch John in jail. It's just part of his story, and it's a pretty compelling part of the story as well, with a guy who, like I said, can be crazy talented. There seems to be a lot of talk and controversy about 
Is, there, is yeah. there a reason that it aired uh, on TV but not in the arena? Uh, no, we just we never meant. I, no, I mean not really. <laughs> there, there, we just never thought to put the the on air vote um, in the arena. It's not not a bad idea. I mean, hindsight being twenty twenty, it's kind of a cool thing to run an arena to let people know what's happening. But we never thought about running it in, in arena. Spike, Spike doesn't seem to have much of a problem with either Brett Rogers. Anyone with criminal records that have been signed really like Brett Rogers and Warren Shiri don't seem to have much of a problem at all with them being aired on television. Nothing, no, no controversy whatsoever. No, no. I, you know, I think. John's again. I, you know, I, I I had been warned about John when we first signed him, and then he did something really dumb, and I cut him. Um, and he's not. He, he would admit it. I mean, it's not. It's not as though he's fighting it and saying I don't think what I said was inappropriate. And then he really cleaned every. He didn't clean everything up, but he had issues. And then when he reapproached us, he, he took a lot of steps to do the right thing. He wouldn't go out to clubs. He wouldn't work in environments where he could make a lot of money as a bouncer and doing stuff like that he was taking crap jobs to kind of stay in the right mold and then he got nailed for something that happened previously so it i i don't think um i think it'd be disingenuous on my part if i now looked at john and went well there's a lot of controversy around you so we're not going to take you back and brett brett you know i was just torn about the whole brett thing as other people were you know brett um brett there's there's no way to kind of excuse or explain what happened there he was out of the game for a long time. He begged us for an opportunity. Um, I had I told his manager no for six months straight, and then I, he finally said, "Will you just let Brett talk to you?" And the guy broke down on the phone and said, "I made a horrible mistake. I'm at peace with my wife. She's taking me back. My kids are taking me back. I'm working a paper route at 3 a.m. in the morning. We're going to lose our house. I just all I'm asking for is a chance." And you know, I, did, I that that's one of those weird balance ethical things where you go you go you know part of your heart goes i i really don't want to have you in the organization because of what you did in one instance and the other part of you goes wow you know guy deserves you know he does seem to have shown a huge amount of remorse and he's made it he's kind of reached a place of peace with his family the person who was the recipient of what happened has taken him back. So you give him a shot. You know, we did. We gave him a shot. So. You about giving guys second chances? I mean, these two guys just mentioned King Mo, Mike Ford. It seems like you're giving guys second chances. Or like well, I, look, I, I've known Mo for a lot of years. I, I think he's a much different scenario. I would defend Mo to the to the grave. I know what happened with Mo, and Ro, Mo got a bad deal. Mo got a bad deal. I could walk. You and I could walk into a nutritional supplement store. A year, a year and a half ago or a year and three months ago and you and I with cash in our pocket could buy the exact same supplement that he took my 17 year old son could buy that supplement and Mo had competed in in Mo had been tested over 55 times by the highest level testing organizations that exist in the world world championships Olympic trials I mean everybody that can test you at an elite world-class level tested Mo clean 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 for years Years Mo turned up clean, and he took a supplement that he should, you know that 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 had a banned substance in it. But there, that you know, to and I understand everybody's accountable for what they do, and I have a lot of respect for that concept in general. But you just you know, it's like three strikes you're out law, where you know one guy commits three robberies, yeah, three strikes you're out. One guy commits a you know a, something that's a you know half kind of constructed felony because he jaywalked during a certain period and suddenly he goes to jail too it just Mo's whole thing was just I think it's unfair and I don't think he's one of those reclamation projects I think Mo is a wickedly talented light heavy he's a great personality he trains like a madman he's a constant source of inspiration and teaching to other guys in his gym and I mean he really he's a he's a really really you know good character Ryan I would say you give you know Here's a guy who made a serious mistake, paid the price, came back, is very exciting to watch fight, and, and really seems to be doing everything right. You know what I mean? He's got a family, he's got kids that he loves, a wife that he's crazy about. I mean, he just, you know, he's making all the right decisions. I mean, it just, you know, I don't know. I guess maybe we, maybe I do have a little bit of a, you know, soft spot for second chances. But, you know, some of them you look at, Ryan, I would make 100 out of 100 times. You know, um, John was a little bit, more of a fuzzy area, and Brett was a much fuzzier area. But, a little concerned about the Copenhagen side, like a little bit, you know, just, just, from like, just, just because of what people think about him, kind of thing. I mean, with like his past form, and like, I don't know, and all that stuff, right? I, well, you know, I just, I think, um, 
I've seen John, you know, he's a, he's a Southern California guy, so I've seen him fight for years. I saw him fight before he was, you know, long before he was War Machine. And uh, he's very, when he's on and he's been training and he's in the good, he's, he's a really exciting guy to watch fight. Um, you know, he's got a lot of Ryan Ford in him type of thing where they'll come forward and they'll throw for the fences and they've got no quit in him. I, I don't know. That's a that's a tough one. I, you know, John has had a lot of issues and, and there's, and I would I wouldn't want to say John will never have issues again. He very well may. But for now, like I said, it's just I, I made a decision to give him an opportunity, and then he got in trouble. I just, again, I think it would be disingenuous of us as an organization to say, you know what, there's just too much trouble now because he really didn't do anything wrong. If he did anything wrong again, he'd probably go, hey, you know, enough. We're, we're through again. But, you know, now we'll ride it out and see what happens. Going back to uh, King Mo, how is his knee doing right now? Expecting that he'll be ready to go by January? Yeah. Uh, Mo left, um, uh, today's Friday, right? Yeah, Mo left early yesterday morning for Holland to train in Holland for six weeks. Um, he just spent four and a half weeks training with the team at Impact, working on all of his wrestling chops. Um, they said he was about 85% back from an explosion perspective. I talked to Mo all the time, and Mo was saying, you know, I'm about 85% back. And then when I saw him, um, we just did a shoot with him, and uh, Mo was at the Zerumskis fight uh, two weeks ago. Two weeks ago? Was Zerumskis one week? One week ago with, with Koreshkov. And um, he said his knee was probably 90%. And he's got a physical therapist in Holland that's going to be working with him to try to get that last 10% done. But, um, you know, I have full confidence he'll be in, in January with us on Spike and fighting in the, in the light heavyweight tournament. And just while you bring up the Zerumskis fight, What happens in the following, if anything, after something like that? Do you speak with the commission after? Does Jerry Poe What happens? Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I think it was a late stoppage. And, and I think it was um, it was the kind of stoppage reminiscent of what we saw with um, Curran versus Joe Warren. It, it just, you know, sometimes, and I, you know, I mean, I, I competed athletically in college, um, and sometimes, and you watch like the U.S. Open in tennis. You watch baseball and stuff. Some guy, sometimes athletes just freeze, like in that moment they just freeze, and you think to yourself, "Whoa, what? You know, wh how? What? What?" You see in basketball, three seconds left, and a guy will just throw the ball to the left, and there's no one there. And I guess you know sometimes referees are going to do that too. I get you know it just it was obvious to me in the Warren situation with Curran, and in the Zerumska situation with Koreshkov. I mean, it's the only two times that I can ever remember throwing my headset off and starting to scream at a referee. Because you're like, you know, at first you see the first couple blows and you go, okay, you're waiting for that body in black to kind of come rolling in and stop the fight and get himself between. And then he, I saw three and four and I was like, what are you doing? So, you know, you, you try to stay calm and take a bunch of breaths because it's not really my place to go nuts and it would be inappropriate. And then after the fight, you talk to the commissioner and you say, you know, gosh, it just, you know, I'm, I hope you saw what I saw and, and, you know, let us know if we can get you tape in case you didn't see it. Because I think, you know, he obviously needs to review that tape and understand that he's, you know, jeopardizing the health and safety of a fighter. Because, I mean, that's the way somebody at, at some point could get badly hurt. So. I know that wasn't in uh, Ontario, it was in Ohio, right? But I talked to the Ontario Athletic Commission. They said that they, like, the commission itself can blow the horn to a fight if a guy's getting too much, having way too much damage. Have you heard about that before? I've never heard that. I, I mean, it, it, yeah, it's yeah. actually a. Um, I don't know who would be that official that would do it. I don't know. He's the guy with the, the guy holding the horns. I really don't know. I was talking to him. That's, you, that's your timekeeper. Right. I mean, it just which would be an odd person to make a call on to finish yeah. of a fight. Um, what about like a doctor or something? Maybe? I don't know. Like the commissioner for a doctor would have to take a look. But, yeah, that's true. Yeah, I mean, it's tough. I mean, it, it just, you know, you, I don't know. I've only seen it happen inside of our cage. I've only seen it happen those two times where it was so obvious to me and everybody was watching. But, um, you know, it's a scary situation when that happens. You just, you, you just, you want it to stop, and your gut reaction is immediately after you see those first two unanswered blows and your arms down, you go, okay, this is over. And then when you don't see the body flying, you know, it's just. The director of Bernie Papado of the Ohio Athletic Commission, he only said that the bouts will go under review. Right. Do you think that's enough? Like, I mean, that doesn't look like he's taking it too seriously. You know, we've, seen, we've seen lots of these. We'll, we'll take it under review. He's not going to really. Get, it, it, tradition has not been much. Uh, Action given back to, on, on the referees, really, like right. never get, there's no consequences generally. I, you so. know, I, uh, I, I would ass my assumption, and again, this is just purely an assumption. My assumption would be it's because um, he he's in a tough spot. 
you know, regardless of how emotionally vested he might be in agreeing with us, it's hard for him to say anything other than we're going to take it under review because, you know, these are guys that are working for him. They're, they're, you know, they're government employees. They're not making a lot of money. Most of them are doing it not because it's to their economic benefit, but they love the game. Um, and he obviously made a mistake, and he was obviously not doing the job the way it needed to be done. But, um, you know, Bernie's, Bernie's pretty good at what he does. My assumption would be on Bernie, having worked with him on a lot of fights, that he would probably review it, and a referee like that would probably um, suffer some kind of, um, you know, I don't even know how you would characterize it, but I would assume he'd go far to the back of the line before he would be allowed to referee um, fights again or would have to go through some kind of a process to get back into the game because it was just it was a bad so. yeah. That's the second mistake with Bellator too. That's yeah. very close second mistake in Bellator. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. I mean, second in Ohio straight away. It just doesn't look like you have much great luck in Ohio really. Yeah. I mean, they, Bernie's good and, and the commission there is usually very tight but you know that's that's one you've got to you know I shake my head with it as well. It's scary. I mean you just you know Zoromska's a good dude and I like him. I've been watching him fight for years and was hoping for more of the Jason High head kicks, but he didn't deliver them. <laughs> yeah, but yeah, I, I'm in agreement with you. So, uh, with Zoila fighting at uh, 125 last week, will will she be, ever be going back down to 115? And if not, is that division kind of dissolved at this point? Yeah, I, I don't think Zoila could ever make 15 again. I mean, her, her cut for 15 in the final of that tournament where she beat Jessica and Megumi in the last two fights was. Um, I mean, she was crying on stage, shaking, begging her husband to cut her hair off. So. I, and she'd been cutting for, I mean, she, she was just 50, she's just not built for 15. I mean, she just, she can't make it. So um, I think with Jessica I, because um, Jessica, Jessica I is going to fight Zoila coming up in AC, which I think would be a great fight. Um, they're both at 25. Jessica Aguilar has said she'd come up. Um, I don't know if Magumi would come up because Magumi's a small 15 pounder. I mean, it'd be awfully hard for her to compete that, that high up. Um, but I think 25 is probably where we'll land. So I'm not sure what we'll do at 15. I mean, it, it, we're kind of regrouping everything at 25, so um, 15 might just go by the wayside, and we might kind of regroup at 25. Which side of those two groups? When you move to Spike, are, are you looking at just keeping the weight divisions as is right now, no additions or anything like that? Maybe like 115 pound division for the men? It, not at this point. I mean, I think I think Bantam through heavyweight is probably where we'll be for the time being. I mean, there are some 25-pounders that are really exciting, um, but I, I'd rather kind of focus on developing what we're doing at 35. We've got some rock stars at 35 that I want to kind of build out, you know, tell their stories, get them on TV, you know, and then, you know, we'll say maybe a year or two from now, maybe if 25 keeps building out. I know the UFC is doing some stuff at 25, and those have been some exciting fights, so... Yeah, we'll keep our eye on it, but for now, I think 35 through through 265 is where we'll where we'll do, land. Do you have an update on uh, Eduardo Dantas? Have you spoken with him? Because obviously, he was supposed to defend his title here against Galvao, and then yeah. um, kept experiencing dizziness and whatnot. Do you have yeah. an idea maybe when that fight might happen? Uh, I, I don't. Um, the bad news about Eduardo Dantas is that he was experiencing dizziness, and he was when he would try to go back into sparring, he was experiencing dizziness and. Um, I consulted with a couple of doctors here that talked to the team down at Novignon, and um, they just, you know, he's basically at this point just out of sparring in totality. Um, he's even been told not to, not to grapple, not to do any jujitsu. Just stay out of it and let yourself heal. You What's know? the sort of, um, I guess, the read you're getting from his doctors? Does it look bleak? I mean, or is this just something he needs to work through and it, it's going to pass? The neurological reports that we've received from Brazil have said he just needs time. Okay. Um, you know, but I mean, I've said it before. I think you 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 can like if a if a fighter comes to me and says my my shoulder's bothering me, but I think I'm going to push through. That's a choice you as the fighter make. I don't have anything to say about that. If you want to push through a shoulder, you want to push through a knee that doesn't feel good. That's your decision. But when it comes to the head, that's no longer your decision because a head is something you can't actually. It's not like a shoulder. You can't go. Oh, that's really uncomfortable. I can't get any kind of movement out of my left hand. So those are the decisions where we've just got to stay. It's like the Joe Warren decision. Joe was calling me three weeks after the fight going, dude, I feel great, I'm ready to go. And I'm like, well, that's, I'm glad to hear that, and why don't you not spar with anybody for another three months and we'll reconsider it. And now he's coming back next week, but it's been a long time since Joe's been in our cage. And I think you've got to take those steps. When you look at what's, when you look at what's going on with the NFL and you look at head injury research right now, um, I think you've got to err on the side of caution when guys take big shots to the head and, and get serious concussions. 
and I think the rest of it is really up to a fighter to make a decision. Is it pain? Is it injury? What is it? You know, that's that's a fighter's decision. But when it, when it's above the neck, I think you got to step in and just say, you know, we're going to take a break. Does it kind of scare you as a promoter? Because I mean, as you mentioned, Joe was calling you saying, "I feel fine," and I think a lot of fighters probably have that attitude. And even though there's medical suspensions, I mean, guys can go to the gym. There aren't you know government officials watching them in the gym. They can just be sparring the next day after a vicious knockout if they want. I mean. Is there a part of you that's kind of frightened about that? I mean, that, you know, you get a suspension, but that doesn't necessarily mean you're, you're healing. You could be in the gym if you want to be, right? Yeah, I mean, you know, we try to keep an eye on it. I mean, I talk to, like, guys like Joe Warren have got such... The, the thing that makes guys like Joe Warren Joe Warren are that they have that attitude. I mean, you know, it's not like you or I or most of us would go, wow, I had a head injury. I'm not actually going to move quickly for the next six months. You know, I'm going to do... And guys like Joe Warren go, rah, I can shake it off. You know, it's just a head injury. And it's and you think you're... You know, you, it worries you. But, I mean, that's what makes them... Who It's kind of like trying to get a leopard to change its spots or stripes or whatever the saying is. I mean, it's just... You, you can't... You know, it, it, there's only... There's so much we can do. I called Joe's trainer. I called... Joe's family. I called other people to say, hey, I know you can get through to Joe, and I really want him to not do anything. I really don't want him to spar with anybody. This isn't something you push through, and you just try to make those points, but there's at some point you just, there's not a lot you can do. You know, I mean, the, the thing that makes those guys those guys is that they'll push through anything, so. Joe, he's coming off two brutal knock losses right now to Villa and to Curran, obviously. Another loss next week, I mean, would you kind of tell him, especially if it's a knockout loss, would you try to you know, tell him that you should hang it up? I, you know, it, uh, you look at you, you look at some of those knockout situations, and you look at them in different fighters, and you look at like Cyborg, or you look at different fighters, and you you look at Chuck Liddell, and you say to yourself, "Wow, um, I think Joe's were different." And and I and I, I that doesn't answer your question, but I think the Alexis Avila shot would have knocked out most middleweights. It was absolutely a perfect hook, and he caught him right at the end of it. And when it landed, it was like th- there were there are few guys that could have. There's I don't know another bantamweight on earth that could have stood up to that shot, and, and it was perfectly timed. The current knockout was just, it, it wasn't so much the one blow, it was the repetitive nature of the blows. Pat just kept hitting him and hitting him and hitting him with shots, and finally he went down. Um, it wasn't as if, like, you don't see what you see in some fighters where you see that glass jaw where you, they just get touched and you go, wow, it's time for you to stop. Um, you know, so we'll see. I mean, this is going to be an interesting fight next week for Joe and see where he is, see if he can take a shot. My assumption is is that he probably can, but if he if he can't, and if we see another knockout loss, um, you know I've got I mean I don't even like to say it because I don't want to fuel Joe or put him in a wrong spot, but I love the guy and he's awesome and he's been awesome for our organization. He's a great personality. He's got a beautiful wife and great kids, and uh, you know I'd have to think pretty substantially about you know where what we would want to do moving forward. You know what I mean? So. Moving back to the women's division, uh, has there been any thought to maybe opening up a talent sharing arrangement with Invicta, like Strikeforce, like a lot of other promotions do? Because there has been some frustration from the women fighters about not getting perhaps the, the amount of fights that they would like. Yeah, um, sure, that's something we could look at um, because there isn't, there, as we discussed before, there aren't enough weight divisions to really make it all happen um, on a consistent, reoccurring basis. There aren't enough top level women at different, there are some great women, there just aren't enough of them at a series of different weight classes to kind of get it rolling in, uh, in great sequence. So yeah, I mean, it, it, some kind of a sharing arrangement. We've been pretty open. We've let Jessica fight out of contract and Kumi just fought out of contract twice. Um, Jessica eyes fought out of contract three or four times. She's fought for NAAFS a number of times. Um, Zoila just got well, but yeah, I mean, I would be open to it because the ladies want to fight, especially at that level. They want to fight, and they're talented women. So, yeah, we'd, we'd be open to that. So we, sorry, uh, we see more and more Russians enter the developer tournaments. Can you tell us a bit about the decision to enter that market, and would you ever consider holding a show in Russia now that you have so much talent? Yeah, um, that decision was about a, a year and a half in the making. Uh, a partner of ours, Alexei Zernikov, kept coming to us trying to f- help us form a relationship with Russia, too which is really kind of the ESPN of Russia. And then we just ended up signing that deal four or five months ago now that's the biggest deal in the history of combat sports in Russia with a channel that carries the World Cup and Formula One and the Olympic Games. I mean, they're really, it's like turning on Espen here. Um, So, yeah, I mean, it's been a great deal, but we kind of were able to lay the foundation over the last year working through getting that deal done and looking at all the different fighters we wanted. You know, you saw Minikov tonight, and you saw Shambalayev, and you see Koreshkov, who's looked great. You'll see Volkov next week. So we really kind of got the creme de la creme of Russian fighters 
and it was easy in that recruiting process because you'd go to them and say, we're working on a deal with Russia too. And it would be like, you know, it, it, like a fighter here saying, we're working on a deal with Spike. And it, so you get the best of the best guys that are, that are ready to sign. And um, we've had a lot of talks with our partners at Russia too about bringing an event over there. But, um, but we want to lay the groundwork. Um, if you track kind of what the UFC has done and what the WWE has done and other organizations that have done combat-esque type of sports overseas, they set the table with TV. They let TV play itself out with high ratings for nine months to a year, get a good deal of fan support, so that when you do go over, people are like, wow, I've been watching Bellator for a year on Russia too. I want to get a ticket and I want to go. So we're probably still a year away from doing a show there, but the ratings have been great. Um, the ratings, surprisingly, to the live event have been great, which goes off at like 4.30 in the morning there, which is weird because they called me and they said, we're doing great numbers at 4.30 a.m. on your live shows, and then they do a replay on Tuesday nights, which does well, too. So it's knock on wood. Hopefully it'll keep going like that with performances we're, we're today. talking about uh, Ryan Fuller again. Uh, can you talk a little bit more about the specifics of what the issues and challenges are in getting him to be here for the sanctions of the states? Yeah, I mean, there's been... Um, We've just been trying to go through the, the governmental process in getting all of the approvals from the government in the U.S. to allow Ryan to travel um, into the U.S. based on his, his criminal background. And, you know, and we'll get through it. Um, our attorneys have said we'll get through it. We're working hand-in-hand -hand with his attorneys. We're very talented, so I'm sure we'll get through it. It's just the question is, will we get through it in enough time to have him fight in the Spike Welterweight Tournament in January? Or will we get through it in February or March? You know, governments don't typically work with amazing speed. So, you know, we hope to get it done in time for this. And if not, we'll get it done later, and he'll be in a tournament in six months. Is the problem still him getting access to the United States and, and then also being sanctioned to fight or licensed to fight? No, there's been no issue relative to being sanctioned anywhere in the U.S. It's just really a matter of getting him in, getting him across the border. And, and I, I'm sure we'll be successful in doing it. I mean, our attorneys have said, look, it's not a matter of if, it's a matter of when. And, and in order for him to participate in the January series, you know, we're only 10 weeks out. So, or 11 weeks out, or whatever it is now. But, but it's going to have to happen pretty soon if he's going to be locked into that 170 group. Last question. Um, is there a, any, what is the possibility of seeing Bellator live broadcast on Canadian television? Uh, well, we've had a great relationship with the score, and of course that hasn't been running live. Um, and we're trying to shoot for, uh, we're, we're trying to see what we can do to help facilitate that. Obviously Spike's got a presence here, and we're going to be a huge push for Spike Network coming up in the States, and that's already started domestically in the United States. So um, you can see it. There, there is some potential to seeing it live up here in Canada once we make the transition to Spike. Will there be no blockout restrictions given the, the, the deal with the score? <clears throat> We'll see. We're still working through that. The score has um, been an amazing partner, obviously gone through some pretty substantial changes recently, um, and we're kind of working through those changes, working through how we're going to um, run the situation with our partners at Spike. But I think there's a probably a uh, very, very high likelihood that Bellator will be live um, on Canadian television next year. Could I be more vague about that? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that even sounded vague coming out. <laughs> Cool. Uh, yeah, so anyway, that's the best I can give you. All right. <laughs> when can we expect you back in Ontario? Uh, we were trying to figure out if we could get a, uh, trying to figure out if we could get an event up here in uh, in April, but Jeff Craig, who runs things here at Rama, said there still is a potential of pretty big snow here in April. Um, <laughs> so for a guy from Newport Beach, I really don't understand that, but he's like, I don't think we could take that chance because everybody's coming up from Toronto. So um, probably June. Because that's when our summer series will Would kick that be off. Here, or Windsor? Uh, here, Windsor is not nearly as much of a problem because it doesn't have the same kind of restrictions. I mean, we're getting most of our audience in Windsor is from Windsor and from Detroit, and you can just drive right over. So but who was the show earlier in Windsor? Yeah, I think there's a high likelihood that one of the there's a very high likelihood one of the Spike shows from the first season on Spike will be at Caesars Windsor. What are the chances yeah. we see? further expansion in Canada, like other provinces in Canada? What are the chances? Are you going to stick to just Ontario? We've just got to find the right fit. I mean, that's the key, is finding the right fit. This place has been great, and, um, and you know, Windsor's been great. Um, but they work like crazy. I mean, this place has been epic. This place has just been rock star solid every time we've come here. So um, it's, just, it's about finding that situation because it, it's one thing for us to do an event where we're selling tickets and placing all the advertising and going through all that process in um, Hammond, Indiana, which is right outside Chicago, which is a market we know. 
more difficult to go through it in Canada where we don't have all the kind of people on the ground and the, and the route. So when you can work with a place like Rama and they've got that all wired, uh, it'd be about finding another relationship that was very similar to this one that didn't conflict with this one, obviously. So. Uh, obviously, there's, uh, you know, the, the Rama partnership has worked out great for you, great for Rama. Um, but there's been a lot of talk at Toronto City Council because a lot of lobbying about uh, trying to get a casino in downtown Toronto. Right. Should that happen, you know, would you be open to a partnership oh, and could uh, Bellator see its first to Toronto property? Proper events under such a scenario. Um, you know, I just um, I'm kind of old school in my loyalty. Um, I would say, you know, if if things keep working the way they're working with our partners here at Rama, this would be our home for Toronto. Um, just because it, they've just it, the, like I was saying earlier, the vast majority of people who are coming up here are coming from Toronto. I, I came so, from Toronto, but you know, I, I rode up on a bus full of Chinese gamblers. I don't know that everyone has that dedication. <laughs> well, I, uh, I appreciate it, and uh, and I just I think this will be our home, and then you know we'll you never know what happens in the future. But these guys have been awesome for us; they're great relationships for us. I mean, this is a consummate kind of relationship. They want us back, and we want to keep coming back. So, from an economic perspective, they're paying us well, and it's working well enough for them so that they're looking for the next date as quick as we can make it happen, where there isn't snow that's going to interfere with it. So, those are the dream scenarios. I mean, we've got one of those with Caesars in Atlantic City. Mohegan, we've got that down with the Hard Rock and people that just have had us back year after year after year. So that's your key, you know what I mean? As, and as long as that keeps going and it's so seamless and they're a great team, we'll just keep coming back here. I got a French Canadian fan. He's asking when Carl is going to fight and asking if it can take place early in the spike launch. Yeah, I mean, obviously that we want to try to, if we can, create the synergies between um, right. the welterweights, these the four rock stars we got here that we're putting into kind of that that web series and that fan's choice of who's the first fight on spike. Um, and that Amasu versus Askren fight. That's an exciting fight. I mean, Amasu, yeah, Amasu's last performance against Brian Baker kind of opened a lot of people's eyes because his movement from a submission perspective can happen so fast that, you know, that, that uh, I mean, Askren's a tough nut to crack. He's a very tough nut to crack, but Amasu's incredibly explosive, and he he's able to get himself, you know, into position for submission really quickly, so... And that's what it's going to take against Ben. You're going to have to catch him coming in, or you're going to have to catch him... I mean. Even the idea of catching Ben in a freak submission is very unlikely. He's just a his he's nuts. You know, he's just his control is insane. You know, just he's a he's a special athlete on the ground. So have you thought about releasing the seedings? Because you're gonna have like the two guys who are along by the fans, right? And you're gonna right. have six other guys. And you said they've been seated already by, by you and Sam, I guess. Have you thought about releasing that publicly? We'll have some some there'll be some interesting adaptations to our format that you'll see as we launch on Spike. I can't go into all of them now, um, but there will be some interesting adaptations that will give some, uh, some, some better clarity to some issues that kind of float out there with us in terms of our tournament format. You know what I mean? I mean, the good news about our tournament format is, is that at the end of it, the best guy is going to win because you've got to win three fights to get to the end of the road. Um, but there are some things we could do to help clean it up a bit. And we've been working on those for the launch on Spike. Just on the topic of Spike, before I forget, I don't know if you heard the conference call a couple weeks ago with the UFC's announcement of Sunning versus Jones. There was an FX uh, guy on, he said, uh, Spike better watch their ass. What did you make of those comments? I, you know, I, I just, I honestly, and I don't mean to sound like Pollyanna, but I don't really give them that much thought. Yeah. You know, I mean, I work, we work 18 hours a day as a team. I'm one of the guys, but there's 70 other people working behind the scenes, and we're just, there's just, there's really not time to kind of engage in that. Um, we just work ferociously hard putting the features together and creating the shows and keeping the fights together that she can have nights like tonight. And it's just, it, it, you know, the numbers are going to speak for themselves and the qualitative level of the shows speak for themselves. And, you know, we'll see. You know, it's a, it's a wildly competitive environment. I mean, it's a, it's a, it's a sports entertainment experience where guys are fighting in a cage. So it's going to give birth to very aggressive executives who run companies in this space. It's not, you know... It, it, it's just the nature of this game. So you're going to get people that are going to make big statements, and I'm, I'm not typically one of them, but, you know, we're focused. I'm confident in what we're doing. We've got, I think, the greatest TV partners in the history of combat sports and Spike Network. So, you know, I like our chances. Do you think it's the beginning of, like, a war of the words between Spike and uh, FX? FX? I don't know. You know, I mean, it's a, it's a good question. I mean, I, I don't think you saw there wasn't a lot of retort from our partners at Spike. Um, it seemed to be kind of a one-sided flow of comment. 
Um, and I just think Spike is with, with me and with us in terms of just hardcore focus on what's going to come, getting the production ready, putting together great fighters and great fights, and figuring out how to, how to put that all together so you can hand it to fans in the best package humanly possible. And, and uh, you know, I think people will be, I think we'll put together great shows. I mean, it, it's good, it's great looking stuff. I mean, you know, look at this season, and a lot of people kind of looked at it and went, oh, this will just be, this is just kind of going to be passing time until we get to Spike. And it's not. I mean, you look at some of these guys. You look at Shamalayev, and you look at Mike Richmond, who lost tonight, and you look at Koreshkov. These are the next pa – I mean, you know, now we're nodding because they've been on this series. Koreshkov wasn't much of anything that anybody thought about. And suddenly you see the demolition of Zerumskis, and you go, whoa, he can fight. So that's the next Pat Kern. That's the next Mike Chandler. That's the next guy who's going to come up and challenge and break into the top ten. So I uh, – you know, I mean, I, I – it's just – you know, like I said, it's not. I'm not trying to to pass by it or not make a, a, a comment that generates a bunch of buzz. But it's just our focus is just. You know, the, the the live event speaks for itself. The fights speak for themselves. The TV show speaks for themselves. The rest of it is is just kind of. You know, it's dead weight. You know. The you view? Like give us a comment with some buzz on the contract from Eddie Alvarez. Yeah, I know. Yeah. In the videos for Spike, we noticed that he wasn't in. Any of them, any of that we, we saw here in the building. So. Well, he, he hasn't been part of the promo plan just because we didn't know if he's going to yeah. be back. You know, so we, we haven't put him in all the promotional materials for Spike and the coming home stuff and the new launch. But he's a significant part of your history, too. Yeah, no, he's just, I mean, you know, and, and some of his fights, I mean, you know, 2011, I thought that was the greatest fight of the year when he fought Mike Chandler and lost his title. But um, he's awesome. I love Ed. You know, I mean, Eddie and I talk. Literally, over, especially since his fight with Pitbull, where he had that spectacular knockout, we've talked every couple of days. Um, you know, I haven't. I'm not trying to f pretend in one direction or other. I'd love to re-sign Ed, but it'll all come down to numbers. It'll all come down to the economics. I mean, one of the reasons that we're here and the, the, you know, the strike forces and the WECs and the afflictions and the listing of the IFLs and the lead XCs and all these groups have kind of filtered off is. Um, so many decisions were based on emotion. So many decisions were based on ego. And our decisions have been empirically based on Excel spreadsheets. We look at situations. We look at numbers. We don't make decisions based on emotion. We run it like a business. Are you, are you so. in a different model now versus, if, say, a Hector Lombard deal comes his way? Are you in a position now that you could react differently than when Hector Lombard was offered that deal? Without being a good specific? Yeah. Just a couple more yeah. for you, okay? I'm good. Okay. You got somewhere you're going to be? <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I think, I think we're in a different position just because of the proximity, the close proximity to the spike launch, um, which has given us a lot of ammunition, not just from an economic perspective, because I think we had some of the economic wherewithal when the Hector deal came across. But, you know, I mean, Hector's deal was, you know, um, you know it was a close to, you know, it was a $400,000 signing bonus, and it was like 300 per fight climbing, and it was a huge piece of pay-per-view. Um, that's a very lucrative deal. And you have to have different, you got to have different business paradigms in place to monetize a deal like that. It's very difficult to get out from under a deal like that unless you have pay-per-views that are doing big numbers. Um, the UFC had those pay-per-views. Of late, they haven't been as strong, but it, at the time they signed Hector, they had those they had some bigger pay-per-views where they could monetize a price tag like that. Um, and you could create an ROI that made sense from a business perspective. But, um, you know, we're not in the pay-per-view business yet. So if a Hector deal came across the table for Eddie, Eddie will probably be putting on spectacularly exciting fights inside their cage. Um, and if it's a different type of structure, you know, maybe he'll continue to fight for us. But it'll really come down to what the deal looks like. And then what I kept saying to Ed is I kept talking to Ed and saying, look, there's other things that we can provide to you. Look at what we're doing for King Mo. Look at what we're taking Pat Curran and we're taking Mike Chandler. We're taking all these guys. We're building out one-hour specials around them, biopics that aren't just look at Mike's greatest fights, but let's learn about Mike Chandler. Let's build up the Chandler brand or the Curran brand. So there's other pieces. There's, so, there's other shows across the MTV Network's platform that we can plug guys into to keep building that brand equity. So um, we offer different things. And on a pure economic basis, we'll see where we'll see where the offer comes from. It'll when, come quick. I, when I, is know, a ninety-day period? Then? I cut it short just because I've known Ed forever, and he's a buddy of mine. I, I've already sent the paperwork to Ed and said go talk to him because he Eddie and I came. Um, Eddie and I just talk openly. I mean, he's talked to me for years, and and he just came to me and said, um, "Look, brother, I, I love you, and I'd love to keep fighting at Bellator, but I wouldn't be doing my family or myself justice if I didn't see what they offer." 
And I was like, okay. So I th we sent him the paperwork um, this morning to just cut it all short and let him go talk to him. Talking to Ed regularly since 2008, hanging on, you know, going out places with him, talking to him. I know he's incredibly bright, knows the business. And as soon as he said that, I was like, okay, we're not going to we're not going to cut a deal before you get a chance to look at what they're offering. So why all, I would just be basically holding Ed out of fighting for 70 something more days? And he's not, you know, he. There was no reason to do it. It was just, it was clear to me, there was no nothing to be played, no other thing to offer. Whereas in other situations with Hector, there was, there was still a dance we were doing. We were trying to figure out could we incentivize him through X, Y, Z. And I still thought, well, there might be a deal to be had with Ed. He was just honest with me, and I was like, well, then go talk to him. Are you, yeah. sorry, no, no. How can you match an offer though if there is pay-per-view points? In? It's impossible for you guys, right? Um, well, you can all, you can match a deal like that because you can say. It, the, there is no guarantee of pay-per-view, and in most of those offers, like Hector, there are certain parameters around it. You have to be a certain place on the card. In other words, it isn't a guaranteed purse. It's if you're chosen to participate in a pay-per-view, and if you're the main event or the co-main event, XYZ would be the points you would get on that pay-per-view. So we can do the same thing. We can say, look, we may manifest ourselves into a company that can do pay-per-view in the next 9 to 12 months, and if we do, we will match that structure. We will give you this many points from this many buys. So it's not the same as a purse guarantee where a company might come to Ed and say, we will guarantee you X plus X, you know, 100 plus this, or whatever the number might be. Um, and in that, we can just say, well, we've got to match it dollar for dollar, and we will or we won't. So it's just a different structure. Um, you've mentioned pay-per-view a couple times now. Is that something like you, you guys got planned or you know, an ultimate goal going forward in the future with this fight partnership? Maybe. I mean, we're, we're, in, a, we're in a very fortunate position right now because we've hit that, that, um, that plateau of being um, cash flow positive, which is something really, I mean, other than the UFC, nobody's ever done. So we, on a month-by-month -month basis, we make money. We don't lose money. We don't make enough money for everybody to go to the beach and have the frothy <laughs> drinks and fly for other jets. But we make enough money where we do events. We're making more than we're spending. And that's a great position to be in because what it basically says is you're going to be around as long as you want to continue to be around, which is years and years and years because I have the greatest job in the world. So, you know, I mean, that, that, what that basically lend, leads to is um, – we kind of know it. If, if, if I threw out a couple of fights to you, it, we would all go, wow, I would pay for that. Or we would say, well, eh, I would watch that on Spike, but I don't know if I would pay $50 for that. Mm -hmm. So that's your barometer. And so when, when we can create, which we will, fights that guys like us would sit around and say, oh, dude, I would stay, I'm staying home and I'm paying for that. <laughs> yeah. Then you know you're in the pay. It's not... The pay-per-view business isn't one of those incredible mathematical formulas like the business plan that, that I put together to form this company. It's a, it's, you've got to build the brands, you've got to build the fighters, you've got to build the stories, but then you know when those fights are there. Mm -hmm. You know, you look at certain fights and you go, is that a pay-per-view fight? It, you know, is there, we have some world title fights coming up now. They'll be great fights on Spike. I would stay home if I were a fan to watch them. But would I pay $50 for them? I don't know. Maybe not. But there will come those fights, and when they do, we'll go, you know what, that's a pay-per-view event. We should do that pay-per-view. And hopefully that comes sooner rather than later. Yeah. I'm also curious about the reality show as well. Uh, more specifically, like, yeah. what exactly, if you can drop any tidbits, that, that's going to differentiate it from The Ultimate Fighter? Um, in the format, you know, any sort of tidbits that you, you got for us? Well, I mean, I think what you can count on is this. The guy who is producing it, Bertram Van Munster, is known for the most part, for The Amazing Race. And the thing that made The Amazing Race and has made it such a great show and continues to win Emmy Awards is that it's, it's really not, it doesn't feel like a reality show. You know, it's not a bunch of dudes in a house and a pretty girl drives up in a car and they all do wacky stuff and go out on dates. It's, it's like a, it feels like a competitive kind of biopic documentary. Um, and that's what Bertram brings to the table and he does it better than anybody in TV. He's got like, I think his 12th Emmy Award was the one he just won for The Amazing Race. So. His team at Profiles are trying to create that kind of character-driven, competitive reality format that doesn't follow a lot of the same track that other combat sports reality formats have followed. Um, and if they're able to do that, which I'm, I think they've got a better chance to be able to do than anybody, we should have a pretty good show. The thing that's the other thing that carries these shows is the one thing I do know is I haven't produced reality television, but I've spent a lot of time with Sam Kaplan and Zach Light recruiting fighters. And I know who we're going to put on this show, and they're really talented. So if, you can, if we can tell the stories the right way 
and, it, and if the format plays itself out right, if fans connect to that format, I think we'll have a really good show because people are going to look at the fighters on the show and they're going to go, wow, those guys can fight. I mean, like, there, there's guys, one guy's going to win the show and he's going to get the big check and he's going to get the, the big accolades and the prize at the end of the, the road. But there will probably be five or six guys that I know are competing right now who will have great futures in Bellator, will end up in tournaments just because Sam and the team have done such a wicked job recruiting talent. So, it'll, you know, it's, um, it's not as easy as putting a fight together because there's a lot of moving pieces, but, um, but I, I, got, you know, I got pretty high hopes for it.